Hey, content creators, welcome to the show. And I am very excited today to have the return of special effects master and writer, Steve Johnson. Steve, thank you so much for being on the show. Really appreciate having you back. Yeah, good to be here. But you have to introduce me like that. It's like the it's like a, a sequel to a Universal ha or a Hammer film, The Return of Steve Johnson. He's well, back he's from the swamp. He's alive again. <laughs> the Return of Steve Johnson. You know what? That's actually a good name for a book. Yeah. Well, you've got two <laughs> books, and and we're gonna plug those right out of the gate because uh, mm -hmm. we're gonna go into uncharted territory. The books are what I would call you charting the territory of your career, which is Rubberhead Volume 1 and Rubberhead Volume 2. The last time we were plugging the Kickstarter for Volume 2, now it's out, and it's got great stories, and it brings you up to, I, I, if I'm not wrong, it is, um, you're kind of going, are you going chronologically through the volumes? And you, you have no, like, no, no, no. no? You got There's different. a whole time travel motif. The whole concept of both books is that they're almost fictional and that they happen in present tense and that my character is traveling through time. Oh, so, okay. I really like that. that. Focus, you know, it adds a, a really cool kind of uh, writerly device, but it also allows me to focus on the most interesting stories I have throughout my career, the most interesting movies, the most interesting actors, directors, et cetera. So I don't have to go crazy. I hate chronological things like that. But let me correct you. Rubberhead 1 has been sold out for quite a while. It's now back in print. Uh, you can order it on Amazon. You can also get the ebook. You can get the audio book, which a lot of people love because I go off script like crazy. I was high as a kite when I did it. But, you know, I'm talking like four or five nights of six hour sessions. Uh, so I go off script constantly. So you get a little more on the audio book. The audio book and the ebook together are really good. But of course, there's nothing like the paper volume. So you can get that on Amazon. However, Rubberhead Volume 2. Uh, has been delayed for a couple of reasons. The publisher picked it up and picked up the rights to the entire series. This is the publisher who got Rubberhead 1 back on Amazon and then reprinted. Um, and they will also be doing the uh, coming volumes of Rubberhead because it's not just a two-volume series. However, <clears throat> you can still pre-order Rubberhead Volume 2 on at Dark Ink Books, darkinkbooks.com. Go ahead over to that site and you can pre-order the soft cover the hardcover, and I think you can order the ebook and the audio book too. I think I'm not sure. Well, that's, that's really cool because I, I love when the author reads the book as well. Yeah. It's, it's, there's nothing better that like if you get a good Stephen King book and Stephen King's actually the one reading it, um, that's always a lot of fun. And I one of my favorite audio books of Fahrenheit 451 is read by Ray Bradbury. Uh, well, so I'm gonna I'm gonna have to check that out. I, I definitely want to hear you read from your own book. Now there's a lot of Again, we're going to kind of go into uncharted territory here, but there is a lot of places that people can learn about you. Uh, most recently, I saw you on the uh, Movies That Made Us on Netflix, talking about Ghostbusters, which we're not going to talk about today because there's plenty of that everywhere, as well as your own YouTube channel. I know you haven't added any videos to that, but there's still a lot of great uh, interview footage with you there, so I'm going to encourage people to go over there. And yeah, that YouTube channel is actually quite simply called Steve Johnson's Rubber Rules. Yep, And we did that in Tennessee years and years and years ago just for fun. And, you know, everyone's enthusiasm kind of ran out because it wasn't monetizing the way we expected it to, even though we have millions. It, it came to, all together, over a million or something, two million views. But I don't know. I wasn't running the business end of it, but nobody ever got paid a nickel. And so all these Knoxville television people are like, fuck this. We're not going to do this anymore. <laughs> it would be nice. But I will tell you, you know, Tom and Alec <clears throat> um, of ADI, I spoke with them at a convention years ago and you know they've got a very very healthy youtube presence on their channel and they said they were inspired to do theirs by mine so at least something good came of it oh yeah no i did they didn't tell me that that's that's really cool now well the problem is had i continued with that youtube series over these past i don't know eight years i would have given away all of my book stuff <laughs> which would have been stupid well i'm I, i'm gonna I'm going to talk a little bit more about that later on in the interview because I, I have some thoughts about that. Um, now, you also, there are, there are two other things that are going on. One that is in production and one I don't know if is in production or not, but you guys are doing a documentary, the Steve Johnson documentary, which yes. I believe ties into Rubberhead. And then there's actually, I, last time we talked, and I, it seems like there might have been some progress with this since, 
a Rubberhead television series? Is that is that a is that a thing? No, not no. What we've been concentrating on is the documentary. The problem with the documentary is it, we've been working on it for about a year and a half now, and we've got the best of the best people working on it, the, the best editor for this type of thing, best producer, best director. And, of course, me, always good on camera, witty, charming, open, irreverent. Uh, but um, <clears throat> the thing is there's so much footage. For the first time about two weeks ago, Nick Taylor, the producer, sent me um, about an hour of a rough assembly of this thing. And my jaw dropped in the few confidants I've shown it to, the kind of beta viewers, have just literally lost their mind. Um, the, the, people are really responding well to it. But here's the problem. It's too long because you look at it and you go, well, you got an hour of this already. You're only going to go 90 minutes. But so that means we have to cut, 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 cut. But you look at it and there's nothing you want to cut because there's something unique and engaging in every single sequence. So my Gut feeling is this ultimately will end up being a limited series for Netflix or some streaming place. Because there's just, I mean, and even if it doesn't, if the if the um, the King's Cut comes out as a 90-minute or two-hour documentary, all of this other stuff that we're cutting together will be available somewhere online that we can monetize because they're spending so much money. I mean, you have no idea. This is the real deal. This is not just like... I don't want to mention any names. It's not like a low-budget effects documentary. It's something that you would see on Netflix, and you'd go, holy shit, that's really cool. So, yeah, the fans are going to be in for it when this comes out because we cover it. So much stuff. It's, I mean, it's not just about the effects and, and all of the movies I've done, but it's about life and death and spirituality and so many things that are really, really important to me. Well, those are the most... I think those are the best documentaries is when you're actually... Um, experiencing experiencing the human aspect of it i think there's there's nothing worse than a documentary that's just like and then they did this and then they did this and then you get a talking head saying like yeah i really liked it when they did that and it was really cool um really getting inside the artist's mind and imagination and that's, uh, that's the approach i took to my book series you know i mean it doesn't start out when i was a baby in houston texas growing up and then go you know consecutively through my life it just bounces around like the insane ping, ping pong ball so have you um are you still doing special effects work now or are you mainly dedicated to writing no i mean the thing about writing is i've got several novels that haven't been uh, published yet um i do think that at least one of them will be by the same publisher i'm working with on the rubberhead series but the thing is um you know, ever since I came, because I was on walkabout, you know, in 2006, I closed my company down, went to the jungles of Costa Rica, lived in a treehouse with monkeys for a year, fell in love with the gorgeous hooker. It was like fucking Robinson Crusoe. It was an amazing period. And I wrote my first novel then. And I've been writing for a long time. But, um, you know, ultimately, I, I lived in Egypt for a while. I went to Tennessee, opened a collectible company there for a while. I went back to Texas, spent time with my family for a while, went to Austin, went to the Gulf Coast of uh, Louisiana and uh, wrote another book there. I lived in a, a haunted suicide stilt house on this darkened bayou's banks and uh, lived there for about a year, wrote another, another novel there. But ultimately I made my way back to Los Angeles. And the problem with Los Angeles, and it's the reason I left and went to the jungle in the first place, is <clears throat> in Los Angeles, Living in Los Angeles, and I hate to sound like I don't like it. I mean, I do, or I wouldn't be here. I wouldn't have been drawn magnetically back. But living in any big city, uh, living in any place where you have history, there's just so much shit to do that keeps you from being an artist. There's just so much to do. I mean, you know people, so look, you just saw it. The phone's ringing all the time. I'm getting texts all the time. It's like a bee stinging me. I hate modern technology in that regard because you're always available. And that was one of the major reasons to move to the jungle. I just changed my name and I changed my number and shut everything off. And nobody knew who I was there except a select handful, of, knew I was there except a select handful of people. And I was able to get back to being a true artist because I didn't have all of this stuff, this galaxy of things that had to be done and calls that had to be returned, all that kind of stuff circling in my head. However, Coming back to Los Angeles, it's just really hard to concentrate enough to write here. This is why you hear all the time screenwriters will go rent a cabin somewhere, you know, and, and just turn their phone off. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> however, once again, adding up the howevers there, yeah, 
I can't help it. You know, people call me all the time, and I do things occasionally. And of course, we all need money. So I, I'll design, I'll sculpt. I'll, I've been teaching, but that's not because I don't like teaching, but I really like the traveling aspect. I've been teaching in Ireland and Belgium. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I, yeah, but now with the virus, the film industry, the entire entertainment industry is basically on its knees and has been so. I had three projects I was actually working on. Um, all the way up through the middle of March, bam, gone now, postponed or forever or shut down, who knows? Yeah, and it, it's it's very interesting. I think this is one of the reasons why a lot of this stuff has been on my mind lately. And I think this is one of the reasons the things you're talking about are why I wanted to talk to you about it. Because your career, a lot of people have their career in effects and they just they set up shop somewhere and they they have their shop. You seem to have turned your career into like a just a way to travel and live and experience all these different things. And and because you're so imaginative, you know, it's like I, I, I imagined if there was like a Rubberhead series, it would almost be something where you kind of jump into these different um, – these different styles of filmmaking or television show, like, you know, when you, when you go to South America, uh, you know, when you left your shop and went to South America, suddenly I, I kind of imagined you as like in uh, that Zucker Brothers movie, Top, what was it? Not Top Gun. Uh, oh, what was it called? It was really so they did like a, rip, a spoof on Blue Lagoon. So suddenly I saw you like kind of in a Blue Lagoon version of, of uh, going to <laughs> South America. That was actually, strangely enough, kind of what it was like. It was... That year in Costa Rica was, uh, you know, in a lot of ways, it was a true dream. What what so many people would would long for, and there I got to live it. I got to experience it, and and uh, and, and bring back that experience, and and mm-hmm. kind of, I don't know. It's it seems to me like I know that right now with everything shutting down and uh, Hollywood's production slowing down, it seems to a lot of people like you know this is a really bad thing. But I'm seeing. At the same time, there's a lot of people kind of going like, well, maybe we don't need this. Maybe we can innovate and do things. Like with Video On Demand, you talked about your going to Netflix and maybe your documentary would be a limited series. I'm kind of seeing more and more of that and thinking it's not just about getting more material in there, getting, you know, having it be a series instead of a movie. One of the things I did in one of my most recent videos, which I titled uh, Hollywood is Dead and Movies as You Know Them or No More, or something to the, that effect. My point wasn't just, you know, a lot of people kind of took that as, oh, you're, you're celebrating these horrible things happening to Hollywood and people losing their jobs. That wasn't it at all. What I'm seeing is because of COVID and the theaters being shut down and Hollywood losing all this money at the same time, there is a fierce demand for content on video on demand. Uh, and it is, it forced, it, because everyone was at home, it forced them to, even people who knew that video on demand existed, they weren't really kind of engaging in it like a, some people were. Suddenly everybody was. And I don't think you can undo that. Um, and now what I'm seeing is that people are realizing things like, wait a minute, we don't have to adhere to a 90 minute um format because we're not making projects to fit into you know scheduling so many screenings in a day and we don't have to do the 22 minute or the 40 minute because we don't have to worry about commercials or fitting into a time slot and then uh with the i don't know if you're familiar with the whole release the snyder cut of justice league thing uh that happened but they decided that the Snyder Cut wasn't... Originally, I think Snyder was going to do two movies. And then in the 11th hour, they said, no, we need it to be one movie. And then, unfortunately, his daughter committed suicide. So they brought in... Um, it was a Joss Whedon to finish it. And it was botched. And now he, the fans petitioned for over a year for the Snyder Cut. And they raised money for suicide prevention, which was wonderful. And a lot of people mocked them, but now the Snyder Cut, and I'm not saying it'll be good or bad or what, but now instead of being two hour mov- two movies or an extended movie, they're actually releasing it as four single hour episodes of this thing. And I think part of it is just kind of the, the business of, of video on demand. The idea is you always want to keep people coming back and streaming and the people want you to stream with their service. But I think it is going to fundamentally evolve the way we tell 
stories on a screen. And I'm excited about that because it's being freed from these constraints, we're going to have opportunities to innovate and come up with new ways of telling these stories because a lot of what, how we told stories before was essentially formatted for these time slots. So I, I for one, would encourage you to uh, please consider doing your documentary as a, as a, as a series or a mini series and, and play with the format, you know, see, see what that can, that can become because maybe it become a documentary like nobody's ever seen before. Yeah. Well, and I think it will. And, uh, you, you know, for, I, I, I do think it will. Uh, there's just so much creativity behind it and the team on it is so good and there's just too much good stuff. And we know there's a need for a huge amount of content out there, particularly now, but you know, with every, this pandemic talking about how it, <clears throat> you know, has affected the entertainment and industry, um, from problems always throughout history, really creative solutions are born from them, you know? And so we don't know what those solutions are gonna be yet, but I have a feeling based on everything you're saying and everything I've obviously been thinking since this happened is that um, it's gonna be a lot easier for young filmmakers to get projects done uh, and, and what my real hope is that we'll return a little bit to the filmmaking days of the 70s, which are my favorite films, because, you know, it didn't cost $200 million to make movies then. It was a, a virtually not a big gamble for the studios. And so they let, you know, new, fresh voices in and make movies that you could never see these days. I mean, movies like, I mean, simple movies, Paper, Paper Moon, uh, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance kid um, they shoot horses don't they uh, butterflies are free there's just so many examples of just really simple movies and a lot of them are, are my favorite types of movies movies that happen in a very finite amount of time with a finite amount of people uh, like a play and a lot of times when plays are translated into films i like them a lot because what plays are about is they're about words uh, movies are about images right yeah. And I just I just prefer words and I prefer this kettle of like it happens in one day or it happens in one night. There's only two people, for example. And, and we've got to do this because if you, you cannot possibly socially distance on a movie set. And all the, you know, I'm seeing a few friends get back to work and the, the, it's just absurd what you've got to go through. Being sequestered, you can't you go to a restaurant. You can't not, not even if you film somewhere where there's a restaurant open. What I'm seeing my friends do is, you know, get tested go work on a movie for 16 hours a day, a day and be driven straight back to their hotel and can't go anywhere else. It's like being in prison. You know, not that movie making isn't like that anyway. After 16 hours, you probably just want to go back to your hotel, but still you can't do anything else. I mean, and you know, I saw this movie just the night before last called Centigrade. I'd never heard of it. It's based on a true story. And it, what it is, it's one of those movies I was, I was telling you about. It was, uh, it, it opens, it cuts right to the chase. It opens with this young couple who are stranded in a SUV in Norway. What had happened is they were driving through Norway, vacationing, and there was a huge snowstorm. So they pulled over to the side of the street to get out of the whiteout and they fell asleep. And the next morning, they're buried in so much snow, nobody knows they're there. They stay, and this is a true story, stayed there for over three weeks. The, I don't want to spoil it, but all kinds of crazy things happen. But the entire movie happens with two people inside of this SUV. And there's no background because it's all snowed in. And it's unbelievably fascinating, entertaining. And and just that those are the kind of movies I like. And I think we're going to see a huge resurgence of that because I did set foot on a set <clears throat> about two weeks ago. I had a friend call me up to do a, a music video, a, this up-and-coming rapper, LaDonna's. And it was insane. It was just insane. There was no social distancing whatsoever. I mean, and particularly as a makeup artist, you've got to be right up in somebody's face. Yeah, we yeah, there's no avoiding it. There was, a, there was a riot scene. We were applying on all these dancers, rubber bullet wounds and scrapes and cuts and swollen eye appliances. And, but, you know, you got to use your hands. you got to feel, you know, when you're gluing an actress's eyelid shut so you can put a swollen eyelid appliance on her, you, you can't stand back. And you know, that face shield, it was dusty. We're in the desert. It was getting all, I couldn't see through it. Um, so, I mean, the, 
And it was a huge crew. The directors won two Grammys for best um, best music videos. So, but yet, in this slow crawl back to whatever normalcy is going to be, every rule in the book for social distancing and non-COVID participation in a project was broken. And I felt guilty about it. You know, I asked some of my top guys to assist me on it. And most of them said, are you fucking kidding me? I'm not going to go get, go get COVID for a music <laughs> video. But, um, but who knows? Who knows? I think that going back to smaller movies, like less of a gamble. Because, you know, I mean, part of this whole new age of of streaming is that that's not a gamble for you either. You've already got Netflix. You've already got Hulu. You've already got Shutter. So it's not like you have to plunk out 50, 60 bucks to go to the theater. You don't have to go anywhere. You can smoke your marijuana and turn it off, make some food. You can do whatever you want. You can pet your cats. You know, so it's not a gamble for the producers making a movie. They need ten, tons of content. It's not a gamble for you. If you put something on, you don't like you click to the next one. Yeah. And, 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 you know, a lot of people pre uh, what I'm finding now is that a lot of the independent creators are being approached right now because of the productions being shut down because the independent creators um, can work with small crews. They don't have to work with unions. Um, they are all over the country. And where you are, the restrictions are a lot heavier than they are other places. Here in Texas, um, it's not so bad. And, uh, you know, yeah, restaurant, you can't get your hair cut. You can't even get your fucking car washed out here. Yeah, you hear all. Go to a restaurant. It's horrible. When when it finally did open back up a couple months ago, when we opened back up, I didn't race out to go to restaurants with all my friends because I thought, well, it's just going to be this way again. It's back to normal. Then they closed them down, and we're going on six months now. It's driving me out of my fucking mind. And humans are social animals, and humans are going to be human humans no matter what the risks are. And I'm finding this in my own group of friends, and unfortunately, even with myself. Of course, I take precautions. I wash my hands. Of course. I keep things as clean as possible. Of course, I wear my mask in public. But on the off chance, I go out to a sidewalk cafe that's open with a couple of friends. You know, you're not legally bound to wear your mask. And so, I, I, I don't know. <clears throat> you know. I even threw a pool party a couple of weeks ago. And you can't socially distance at a pool party. And, and, you know, it just because it's just I can't take it anymore. And if I see somebody I haven't seen for a long time, I'm not going to stand six feet away from them. And and I know people don't want to hear this, but it's been fucking six months of this stuff. And, uh, yeah, it's just. Well, here's the thing. It's first of all, I take my daughters to our HOA pool almost every day. It's the only entertainment that they have at the moment. Their schools are opening up soon. Um, I've had every respiratory illness possible, uh, including COVID <laughs> back in April. Um, it sucked. It sucked when I had pneumonia. It sucked when I had bronchitis. Um, but you know, we get sick and sometimes it's really dangerous and sometimes it's not. And yes, you can take your proper precautions, but at the same time, um, you know, none of us are getting out of this alive and we all want to actually live our lives. So you're right. We are social people. So you kind of have to, when you go out, you have to gauge what kind of risk you're going to take. And to be quite honest, this is something I've been telling people as well. I mean, life is always going to have risk every time you get in your car, you know, to go driving somewhere. I can't tell you how many times I've almost been, or every once in a while, been run off the road. Um, the people, there are people who are just not going to let this stop them. And those are the people who are going to take advantage of the situation that everybody else is kind of waiting well, some people are going to go, okay, you all wait. I'm going to go do this thing. I'm going to do it on a low budget, and it's going to be ready. And when the next wave of, uh, you know, people are, you know, streaming services or whatever are looking for their acquisitions, I'm going to have something ready for them. And you're absolutely right. I actually – here's the thing about what I think video on demand is creating, and I think you're absolutely right about the, you know – Plays being about words. I, I've said this on my channel before. They say that novels are about what people are thinking, plays are about what they're saying, and movies are about what people are doing. Exactly. But why do... I think these days, movies being about what people are doing is kind of... It's just a, uh, a default that we go to because we see so many action-oriented movies. But there are great movies where it's just people talking and it can get very intense. One of the things I've said in, in another, again, I do videos about writing and I just did one about writing dialogue. People don't realize that dialogue can be action. 
you know, you people, you know, they think of dialogue when they say show don't tell. Well, yeah, but in the terms of dialogue, that means like, you know, don't just dump exposition. Don't just blather. Dialogue and subtext can show you a lot about a character. You can learn a lot about a character, but as much about what they don't say or the inflection of their voice, or you can see that they're, maybe they're saying something, but they're actually kind of talking around something else to get what they want. You can, you know, Silence of the Lambs is a classic example, Clarice and Hannibal Lecter. They are verbally sparring and that is action. So, Mm -hmm. and I believe that what Video On Demand is going to afford is, people making movies like this on low budget. And I think what's going to happen is people are going to see through video on demand that there are other ways of telling stories outside of the big Hollywood blockbuster. And that doesn't mean that they won't want the Hollywood blockbuster. But yeah, you know, we could see the return of independent auteur directors. We could possibly have another wave of films and and the next easy writer for a generation well and that's a good thing i'll tell you something if i never see a fucking explosion again i'll be happy i can't take it i just can't take it i I can't i mean you know back in the heyday when all this marvel stuff started i was working on all these big movies and you know when i was doing the hulk with jonathan hensley and gail hurd before ang lee's uh, you know, we made huge animatronics and, you know, and we're, we're, we're trying to develop this film and we spent a ton of money and a ton of time making all, so many characters. And at some point they're like, well, listen, Steve, the movie, uh, you know, we know the Hulk's 12 feet tall, right? And he can basically fly, he can do anything, but that's not enough these days. We've got to have his final battle with Super Hulk. And I'm like, all right, John, who's, uh, how, how big is he? And he's like, He's so big, we can't even film him. Because, you know, at some point, you get something 20,000 times the size of Godzilla. You can't even get a camera at it. And it's just like, I can't take that trend in filmmaking. I cannot take it. Well, when you say it out loud. It's always the same fucking story. I'll tell you what I can take. Romantic comedies are always the same story, too. But it's about, you know, if it's interesting or not. Sometimes it's just... You just want to chew gum with your eyes. And so you know what the formula is always. The guy meets the girl in a cute way. They hate each other. They get together. And then he ends up chasing the, the, the after to get to the airport before the plane takes off. Every fucking movie is like that. Right? <laughs> but there can be interesting takes on that. I just saw one that was so good. I actually studied it. I watched it three times. And it's called The Wrong Missy. Have you seen it? The Wrong What? The Wrong Missy. No, I haven't heard of that one. Oh, my God. It's on Netflix, and it's all about the performances. It's so unexpected, and it's so fun to watch. And, again, it's just a simple story, and it's just the performances and the casting and, of course, the writing is what makes it stand out as a romantic comedy. But, you know, I guess some people like genres that other people don't. I used to love horror movies. I can't take them anymore unless they're incredibly unique and I'm in the right mood. You know, it's it's funny because the reason that I make movies now is because, you know, people are constant. I have a stack of DVDs that uh, my co-producer keeps sending me because he buys them on Amazon, watches them once and then and then sends them to me. And I just I, I can't bring myself to watch most of them. And I realize the reason that I make movies is simply because the movies I want to watch are not being made. That's it. Yeah. And, yep. and the movies I want to watch, I enjoy. And we talked about this the last time, uh, and it was a couple of years ago, so I don't expect you to remember. But, you know, it, it's... Um, I don't know, two days ago at this point. <laughs> I, I, Who I, are you again? Where am I? What planet are we on? I'm, what day is it? I'm Christopher. You called me. You wanted to interview me because I am the next generation of, of filmmakers, even though I'm in my 40s. I'm still young, oh, damn it. Okay. Excellent. How's our interview going? It's, go- it's going great. Uh, anyway, you were continue. You were talking about how handsome I am and, and how I should be in front of the camera as well. Um, anyway, no, but it, I enjoy we talked about before enjoying the challenges of limited resources, because like you said, you know, when they ask for the Super Hulk, first of all, it's like. It's dumb. And I, 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 I'm i sorry, but, you know, it's like I enjoyed... Well, there, may be, there may be a reason Universal didn't throw down $100 million for it at the time. That was the most expensive movie ever budgeted. Oh, man. You see, now, the... the um, and I did enjoy the Marvel movies, but I feel the same way, and I've heard a lot of people say this, 
they had Endgame, and now they were doing the next wave of Marvel movies, or supposedly they're going to. Who knows what's going to happen with it now? But most of the people said, well, we had Endgame. That was the end of the story. I don't think I need to go see any more Marvel movies. And I think that's... Yeah, they do. I mean, people are, I think, addicted to these things, like they're drugs. That's you a know, yeah. That's a good one, point. When, when one stands out, like Black Panther, and a lot of people said Wonder Woman, you know, I will sit down and bite a rubber bullet and watch it. And I have to say, I, it, it, it gives me it's entertaining for a little while. But you know, once the explosions start ramping up and the fight starts ramping up, and you know what's going to happen at the end anyway, who gives a fuck? I you well, know I want to watch Moana. Moana follows the Disney formula to a T, but it's just such a gorgeously made film. The songs are outrageous. The performances are great, and it's not violent. You know, I guess I'm getting softer in my old age. Well, no, I got to say Moana and um, another one that Pixar did up are probably two of my favorite yeah. films that have been made in the last ten years. Uh, and I could go on and on about how Moana and Up are basically the same film as well, um, yeah. but they are done. They're both done in different ways and and with the thematically different, and and they w- both work wonderfully. You know, I I took my family to see Wonder Woman, and my girls wanted to see Wonder Woman. Uh, my wife and my two girls, so I'm the only guy in the family, uh, unless you count the dogs. But um, with me. I enjoyed Wonder Woman, but I realized what I enjoyed about Wonder Woman is that uh, Gail Godot, Gail Godot, however you say her name, um, she's just so damn charming. She smiles and you smile, you know, and it's not just that she's beautiful. It's not about lusting after or anything. It's just she look, feels like someone that you want to spend time with. And uh, the big disappointment of that movie was the end scene where they got... You know, and a very a very fine actor. I forget his name um, to play the villain, but they just essentially went for the lowest common denominator. And his lines were literally, "I will destroy you." And I'm like, "What are you doing? You guys were doing so well. You know, you had a charming cast. Your script was going well, and then you finish with that. And it's, you know, I would much rather. And and I, I do enjoy science fiction movies. I do enjoy horror movies, but I. And I'm especially into Lovecraftian themes, but I, I, damn it, I have not seen a Lovecraftian theme anything, and I haven't seen Color Out of Space yet, which everyone's raving around about. But you uh, know, I actually have to say I love Richard, the director. I, I was going to do Island of Doctor Moreau with him. And that's right. That's right. Yeah. I worked thing with him. We were so tight for so long, and so I thought, and it was getting great reviews. The Color Out of Space, and I watched it, and I almost couldn't finish it. My thing is, if I start a book, I feel like a failure if I stop reading it if i start watching a movie most often i will never turn it has to be so not what i'm into that i'll turn it off i just very very rarely do that um so i watched the color out of space really late one night and it just annoyed the shit out of me because <laughs> i felt like richard was falling back on too many horror movie tropes and it was just so annoying and it did end up with basic explosions of light and color, and it's just like, this is too much. It was really annoying, and why do you want to do that to me? Why do you want to do that to me? I'm just relaxing. It's 2 in the morning, and now suddenly everybody's screaming and getting killed, and it's just nuts. And, you know, that kind of film can be handled in a certain way that I do like. Like, there is a really interesting, very low-budget film that was made in France called as above, so below. Have you seen that one? I have, and I actually was. I'm. I until that point, I had sworn I hate all found footage films. Uh, that one, I watched twice. I came yeah. back to it. It's really good. I mean, to talk about claustrophobia, uh, I'm very claustrophobic, and <clears throat> this is why that movie Centigrade freaked me out. With the guys are stuck in the car for three weeks. Um, but that one, they actually shot it in the catacombs in Paris. And I've been in those catacombs and they really had to go in there. And you remember the character that's really claustrophobic? They wrote that in and ad-libbed that shit because he really was oh, claustrophobic. Oh, wow. <laughs> underground and getting lost and just all this weird stuff is happening. I really, really, really enjoyed that. But, you know, part of it was because I hadn't heard anything about it. I just discovered it on Netflix one night. It was like three in the morning. I was on a movie marathon. I'm like, holy shit, this is really original. And the scares are unique. 
you know, it's not just a bunch of gore, it's just like really psychological stuff, like almost like the Tenet, Roman Polanski film or The Exorcist. Oh, yeah. Well, this, um, my favorite Polanski film is The Ninth Gate, and I, I love, I love watching that movie just because it's a slow burn, but they hold your attention the entire time. But with As Above and So Below, um, they did great with the claustrophobia. You're absolutely right. But what they did was, in addition to scaring me, not with jump scares, but, you know, with the claustrophobia, but they kept me curious the entire yeah. time. Mm-hmm. I was curious. I actually, yeah. after I watched yeah. it, I went on YouTube, you know, and how they have that, you know, such and such movie explained. I was like, yeah. there's layers going on in this movie. I want to see what people are saying about this. And, yeah. um, and yeah, I, really, I actually often do that myself. If I watch a movie that I really like, I'll look it up online and see what people are saying about it. What did I maybe miss? Yeah, and people, that's one of the great things. Now, this is one of the things I was talking about with Video On Demand is, you know, with film, we think in terms of filmmaking, now everything is Video On Demand. YouTube, you know, yoga videos, instructions on packaging, like, you know, we're competing with all of it now. And, um, and I think that's part of how we're going to see content become uh more innovative we're going to see people telling stories in different ways i mean we may find somebody that that decides to tell a story using nothing but you know wooden and cardboard puppets i've got a friend that makes brilliant puppets out of just wood and cardboard and he's experimenting with green screen now and i'm like you know if you were to put that in front of a producer and say I want to do this as a feature they would be like no way we've got you know cgi and hundred million dollar budgets but now he can do that and and he can tell stories that he wants to tell and 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 going back to the lovecraft thing one of the things that bothers me about the lovecraft stories is that i mean i love tentacle monsters as much as the next person but it's always this like you said it's the same thing there's i want to try and like lovecraft has so much nuance to him that you could you could take those ideas in any direction. And, and speaking of romance, I, I, I probably shouldn't say this out loud on my own show, but I am writing a Lovecraft theme love story. And it's not a love story that just takes place while Lovecraftian stuff is going on. The actual romance is tied into the ideas of Lovecraft and the, um, the final result, the final outcome of the romance is, is dependent on it. And it excited me so much because it was like, I've never seen anybody try and tackle, you know, like I said, they just go for the explosions of the blood and the gore and the people dying. It's like I've never seen somebody actually take Lovecraftian ideas into the direction of like, how would this how would this affect a couple? Um, and as far as I know, I don't think anybody dies in the uh, in my story. Now that I'm thinking about it. But I mean, it's hey, like can I interrupt you for a second. Do yeah. you have a pause button on your thing or do you here, show the. Uh... Or you can't show them, but talk to the audience about my cat. He's a rescue while I'm gone. For a He's second. a big, floomfy orange cat. A floomfy I His use. His name is Chaos because he's very chaotic. Okay, you can. I'll be right back. You, you are right back. I mean, I can always edit this out. The cat has run away, so I'm just going to vamp. Actually, what I'm going to say is this is this is uh, end of part one of the interview uh, for my audience, but we're going to come back for part two. And uh, thank you for listening. Uh, it, Steve and I talk about the future of uh, filmmaking and content creation. So be sure to like, subscribe, and hit the bell for notifications. Share this video. Steve Johnson, Rubberhead Volume 1 and 2. Look out for the documentary. This is going to be a good one. I hope they make it into a docu-series. Um, watch out, Tiger King. So anyway, we're coming back for part two. So stay tuned. <laughs>